Hello, everybody. Uh, so, as Betty said, my name's Simon Wanner. I'm a uh, Microsoft MVP from the UK, and I do lots of Spark things at the moment. So, I came from traditional BI background. I did lots of analytics. I built warehouses. I did lots of SQL and SSIS, and lots of cubes, and all of that kind of fun stuff. And then over time. Uh, we kind of adopted Spark. We kind of went into Azure. We started learning how to do things that are a little bit more flexible. Um, my shtick is whole, all about how do we save time? How do we make life easier? How do we avoid writing an SSIS package for every single different data set I want to load? How do we build things that are a little bit more data-driven? How do I build things that are metadata-driven? How do I build things that are flexible and generic and scalable? Um, so that's my job. That's kind of what we do. Uh, so, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how that works. So, Databricks is Spark Engine in Azure. Yeah, session done, finished, complete. Uh, it is that easy. It is a management layer on top of Spark. So, I'm going to do a little bit of an intro, talk through how it works, talk through how you get started with it, and then kind of just a fairly open demo of just cracking on, querying some data, pulling some stuff in, seeing how we go. Uh, that's kind of the plan. Um, so, yeah, as Benny said, any questions, pop them in the uh, chat. Desperate for a question, feel free to shout at me. Uh, and yeah, we'll go from there. So, GitHub, I do have uh, slides for this. I've changed the slides around slightly, so I'll get those updated later. But generally, if you want some slides from the demos, you can get it from my GitHub at that link. Again, I'll post that in the chat afterwards anyway, so it'll be there if you need it. Okay. So, that's what we're talking about. What is Databricks? A few patterns. Orchestration, we may or may not get onto. So the key thing I want to push today is just showing you some Python, showing you some querying, showing you how I tend to work with the data, how I tend to actually sort of my day to day, how I get started and kind of the Cody Cody bits. Um, if we smash through it, no one has any questions. I can keep on talking and show you how you link it to ADF, show you how you validate data, all of that kind of stuff. But for now, let's talk about where it came from. Because that's one of the important parts. You see, Loads, loads of marketing material about Databricks. Everyone needs Databricks. Databricks is great. Um, and it's kind of important to know where it came from and kind of why, why we use it. So I'm going to spend like maybe 10, 15 minutes, put it in context, tell you how it works, and then we'll just look at Databricks and we'll start coding some stuff. So firstly, back in the day, Google came out with a thing called GFS. Simon. Are yeah. we supposed to be seeing your uh, your PowerPoint presentation because we're just <laughs> seeing your face? <laughs> I might help if I shared my screen. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. you know, I figured you were just doing an intro, but yeah. I mean, I was, and then I, I hit kind of you know present, and then I just forgot to actually share. So let's. Yeah, just... well, that's okay. It's 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 forever on the interwebs now. So. There we go. <laughs> I'm a pro. I've done this before. <laughs> okay. Better. Can you see the screen? Yep, cool. it's there now. Okay, so actually anyone who needed the GitHub link that I just talked about, um, there's actually a GitHub link. Okay, cool, right. This is what we're talking about. Onwards, Google, start from here. <laughs> okay, so... You've still, uh, you've still got an, uh, a, a pop-up window from your Intel driver support in the left-hand corner. I know, but I don't know if that's going to go away. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Moving on to coding, we'll get rid of that. That might be there for some slides. Do you want to try and get rid of it, or is it all right? Uh, no, no, just just carry on. That's good. I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of it. I mean, I can see it. <laughs> Everyone can see it. My driver needs an update. It's all okay. Cool. So, the GFS papers were released. Now, this is essentially Google trying to deal with huge and huge, huge, huge amounts of text data coming from trying to index the web, right? They're just getting this massive, massive, massive variety of text data going, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this amount of data? It's kind of like you're reaching a point in technology, certainly kind of, you know, 20 years ago, of trying to get data onto a disk. And you reach kind of um, bottlenecks, you reach I.O. bandwidth um, problems. So they came up with this whole thing of saying, well, actually, how do we split data up? And GFS, this whole idea of saying, take a little bit of data, spread it across a whole ton of disks, actually you could copy that, I mean, lots and lots of different copies of it, became what we call HDFS, the Hadoop file system, which is actually implemented in Azure, in AWS, in all over the place. So if you're looking at blob storage, 
So if you're looking at um, ADLS Gen 1 or ADLS Gen 2, it's all the same thing under the hood in that they're using this thing called HDFS. So I've got a big old CSV file and I land that in my lake. Beneath the scenes, kind of underneath the murky water, it cuts it into several different things called extents. So if I've got like a two gig CSV file, when I log in and I look at it, I just see a single file. It's just one CSV. But actually, it's held across as lots and lots of different small segments and different cuts of that same CSV. So I can access it. In this case, I can read six different chunks of that CSV in parallel. And that's a big thing. Parallelism is what it's all about. So HDFS, the whole idea of that breaking it up is to say, I've got different segments. And then I go and put it across lots of different disks. So each disk has a different combination and a different subset of those segments. So I can not only access different parts of one file in parallel, I can have several different processes access uh, those parts all in parallel. It's all about parallelism. So that was a big, huge thing to say, well, actually, we can do storage better. We've got different ways of structuring data and spreading it out. But then if you're accessing it via a single box and you're, kind of, you're pulling it onto a single server, that doesn't really help. You still get bottlenecks. You still have a load of problems. So along came this thing called MapReduce, which is kind of the compute side of things. So we've managed to spread a load of data out across our disks. Why don't we spread out the compute as well? Why don't we tell it actually break up the actual, the grunt, the, the hard work? So that's MapReduce is kind of doing that. It's taking a complex job, some kind of aggregation, and spreading the workload out across those different spread out disks. The canonical example is the kind of, I'm trying to index the internet against Google, saying, I've just got a huge amount of text. And I want to do word counts. I want to find out trends. I want to find, is this a website about cats or dogs? So I want to kind of just spread that work up. So I've got one bit of data, which is my website with my big ream of text. And I can do a split. And I can say, well, actually, that bit of data lives over there, that bit of data lives over there. And each one of these blue boxes can be done by like a separate bit of compute. So we're talking about parallel tasks. So for that, each sentence there, that this is a large document, this might come from a log file, I can give those to different servers and say, well, you do that, you do that, you do that. They can then map it into a data set and say, well, this is the word, this is a count, and just change the shape of that. And to do that, they don't need to talk to the other servers. So I've got like little individual blocks of work that I can just distribute and say, well, you do that bit, you do that bit, you do that bit. And each return a bit of data saying, well, for this word, I've got this many, for this word, I've got this many. So I've, kind of, I've shuffled. I've reorganized my data, and now it's organized by word rather than by its original sentence. So it's kind of like this idea of kind of changing the data from the blocks that it's stored in, doing bits of individual parallel bits of work to then change the data into other structures, and then I can pull that back and I can reduce it by an aggregation. So rather than having lots of different ones and different records, I can just go, well, I've got two of those, two of those, two of those. So that kind of idea of taking up essentially a query some kind of aggregate query and saying, split it up into lots of different pieces of work, spread out how it's working across things, is kind of the core of where all of this stuff came from. And those ideas evolved and grew bigger and got more complex, but that's kind of what's in this whole thing called Apache Hadoop. It's, it's the origins of big data, right? It's what people, when you say, I'm doing big data, people think MapReduce and that whole background. So that is kind of core to where we are these days. But it's slow. I mean, yeah, you can you can parallelize. You can actually query huge amounts of data. So it made it possible to get hold of huge, vast amounts of data and actually query it. But it's not very fast because each time we're kind of breaking that data up and putting it down and breaking it up and putting it down, essentially each evolution of that data is a massive read and write, despite the fact that we're doing it in parallel. So at that point, 2012, uh, a chap called Matei Zaharia came along. And Ian UC Berkeley, with a load of his colleagues, came up with this thing called Spark. And that's essentially doing those same things, except putting an engine around it, making it a bit smarter about how it optimizes things, and most importantly, doing things in memory. So saying rather than just the data's on disk, and then do something and put it down on disk, it's pull the data up, do a load of work in memory, and then put it down. And that just makes things so much more efficient. So Spark is Big data, it's doing the same map reduce, kind of break things up into smaller tasks, do some incremental processing, but it's optimized and it's in memory and it's fancy. So they came up with this idea, they donated it to the Apache Spark Foundation, it became an official uh, first class pro uh, project. 
And then what do you do when you've invented this really cool, amazing thing that gets adopted by a lot of people? You start a company that sells it. So Databricks was started by Matei Zaharia and Ali Gozi and a lot of those guys who invented Spark. They went on to start the company called Databricks. And they're still the, by far the largest contributors to the open source Spark project. So Databricks is a management layer, a wrapper around Spark that makes it really easy to use Spark written by the guys that invented Spark. If you need to know what Databricks is, that is the, the guys who invented it, made a company, they now sell it, that's Databricks. So what do we use it? I mean, my, my classic example is if I'm doing some data processing as a data engineer, if I'm trying to do some kind of data warehousing, I want to take data from one place, put it into another place in a different shape with some enrichment, with some ML scoring, with whatever, I will do that by Databricks these days. It is a really, really powerful data processing, data preparation engine, which is cool. But it can also handle lots of different data types. I can throw things like JSON, I can do a Kafka stream, I can do um, geospatial encoding. There's, there's a ton of different stuff you can actually build into it. So it's not just like a SSIS data pipeline type thing, it's massively flexible in terms of all the different things it can speak to. And then you can also answer the hardest problem currently that we face as a society, which is, is it a cupcake or is it a muffin or a chihuahua? You know, kind of real data science problems. As in, you can do visual recognition, you can do, you can put videos through it, you can do audio encoding. It allows you to write a data science model as a core part of your data processing, but on a single box. And the single boxing is important. You know, so if I'm learning to use a system for streaming and for machine learning, and for just general data processing, and for my general data analysis, and it can all be using the same language in the same system managed by the same people, then that's huge. And that's kind of one of the real benefits is just how much it talks to all this different stuff. Um, importantly, you can use lots of languages. So you can use Python, you can use Scala, you can use R, you can use SQL. And you know, the SQL language layer is actually really, really rich. There's lots and lots of stuff in there. So the fact that it's not saying, I have to learn this language, it's bring the language that you prefer from some of the most popular data processing languages and it'll support it and it'll scale. And the benefits of the Azure version of it, obviously it's got lots of integrations. So it can talk to Cosmos DB, it can talk to Cognitive Services, it can write data directly into Azure Synapse these days. So it's all about kind of having this integral part. Now, obviously it's, for me, it's a piece of that puzzle. It's part of a wider architecture. And I'll be a little bit careful of the marketing. If you talk to Databricks on their own, then they will say it's the one and only thing you need in your entire data platform. For me, it's just this brilliant jigsaw piece that sits in between having a relational warehouse layer, sits in between things like Power BI, sits in between you know, kind of things like Data Factory to orchestrate it. You know, kind of you can extend and augment Databricks to just add a load of richness to it. This it should be familiar to anyone in the BI analytics world, like a traditional warehouse. Think of people saying, I've got some source systems, I've got my ETL tool and I'm landing in a staging table in that database. And then picking it up and doing some processing and putting it down as a clean stage. I'm picking it back up and shaping it into facts and dimensions and various different analytical objects. And for me, that is the devil. That's, that's, that's old school now mainly because of the, the speed of reactivity, how quickly you can react to changing requirements in business. If someone says, I've got a brand new data set, can you just land it and get it cleaned? We don't know what fact or dimension it's going to be yet, but can you just start tracking that data and start using it? Um, and most of the time the answer is, well, no, because we need to put it in the database project and do a release and it needs to go through our DBA to find a release window and all these barriers that have grown around traditional warehouse developments just slow the whole process down. So if we're talking lakes and we have the same idea, the same evolution of data, I've got my uncleaned data, I've got my prepped ready to um, query data, I've got my enriched data that I've done some shaping and enrichment of, and then I've got my warehouse. And the lake area, because it is much more reactive, it's less kind of uh, constrained, it's, you can just throw a folder of data in there without having to write any code and do a deployment, then just suddenly it becomes a lot more reactive, becomes a lot quicker. And then you can have a warehouse and you can put data in there and you can manage that in a very disciplined, auditable way. 
but it's the idea of having the two sides of the coin, the flexibility of ad hoc analytics and the ability to pull down some open data from the web, land it in a folder, mash it together with your company data and try something, as well as still having your financial reports and regulatory reports and all that kind of stuff. The, the, they are two sides of the same coin. So the eagle eye might say, but this isn't the first time we've been able to use Spark in Asia. We've had HD Insight for an absolute age. And it's true. You know, could have HD Insight been around for a long time and is Spark in Azure. It can do traditional map reduce, can do pig and all that kind of stuff. But the problem is it requires a lot of configuration. It's really hard to get started with. You know, so there's base things that you have to have installed. Yarn, yet another resource negotiator, and Bari, which is your management layer. Map produce the actual engine to do traditional big data, Spark, your in-memory stuff. And that, that already feels like, okay, there's a few things I need to get my head around. But then if you want to be able to use a SQL layer and write some SQL, you need Hive and HCatalog. Um, to do your kind of R, to do any ML, to do additional things, you need some more libraries. You need Zeppelin to have your notebooks and actually get the interactivity. You need things like Uzi and Flume. You want to do kind of some scheduling. You want to do streaming. And it grows and grows and grows and grows. And each one of these things has its own configuration, its own set of its own management. And that's, that's the argument. That's quite hard, honestly. If you're just starting out with this stuff, that's really, really hard to kind of just jump into a lot of things. And the HD Insight is really, really good, but just requires, it's kind of like a fairly high technical barrier to entry. So a lot of kind of big is saying, can we just make this stuff a lot easier? Um, so it's not brand new, this whole idea of Spark. Simon, just, just quickly, Chris, yeah. uh, Chris has got a question that will be too difficult to answer otherwise. Um, he was asking about the previous diagram, but that's two slides ago now. Yeah. Is, uh, is the writing an enriched step back to the data lake as an additional file, or is that just representing a logical process? Yeah, so the different stages of the lake, I mean, honestly, I, I do them as actual physical materialized layers. So I land the data raw in its original state as an immutable delta. I land it in the clean stage because it's really useful for data scientists and various people to not have to replicate that whole data cleaning each time. And honestly, enrichment, if you're making things like your product dimensions, if you're doing data dimensions and, you know, without actually materializing that, either you've got people who have to go to the warehouse or they have to go and rebuild that business logic and you end up with various different silos recreating it. Because Data Lake is inherently cheap. The, the storage layer is, is cheap to just keep data there. Uh, usually you know, far, far cheaper than keeping it in the relational side. So in which we keep data in because there isn't that much an overhead. You could use it as a logical layer and then push it into your relational if everyone is always accessing the warehouse. But in practice, we found there's just generally quite a lot of value in having those enriched kind of produced uh, and data layers there. So we just do it out of, uh, that's our, our de facto default is to land it. But you, could, you don't have to. <laughs> so it depends, thanks. Yeah, the consultant answer, every answer is it depends. <laughs> right, thank but, you. Uh, yes, we land it. Carry on. Cool, okay. So yeah, you've got various different options for how you do big data in Azure. Now the one over on the right isn't really there anymore. Um, that data lake analytics kind of was around and had uSQL, which is kind of C-sharp, kind of big data, kind of other stuff. Um, and then between HD Insight and Databricks, Databricks just has, it's a lot quicker. It's a lot, generally a lot faster because they're using a more optimized Spark engine because they are the ones writing the Spark engine. Um, and just generally it's a lot easier to get started with. However, things are changing. So this, this landscape has changed because we've still got Databricks and Databricks have been in Azure now for a couple of years. You've got this new thing in the middle called Azure Synapse Analytics, which is it has a Spark engine. And between Databricks and Synapse, so Databricks uses the open source Spark engine, but has a load of extra functionality, extra libraries, extra stuff on top of it. Whereas Synapse is pretty pure vanilla um, Spark currently. And the whole thing is we don't really know what Synapse is going to look like just yet. It's kind of just been out, put out recently into public preview. It's not GA yet. We don't know how good it's going to be at a lot of stuff. It's got some extra things. So you can write C-sharp in Spark if you're in Synapse. You can't do that in Databricks. But currently, you can't write R in Synapse, but you can in Databricks. So it's all a bit of a toss-up. Databricks is what we're here to talk about today. So we'll crack on with that. The other option that you do have, if you want the, the power and scalability of Spark, but you don't want to have to learn any code, you don't want to have to write any Python, is you do have Data Factory. So Data Factory has a thing 
called mapping data flows, which is all for that. It is for dragging and dropping something that looks a bit like a um, SSIS data flow. And then when you hit go, it'll turn it into a Scala jar and it'll put it into a Spark engine. It'll run it for you. Um, it's not quite as flexible. It doesn't have all the libraries. Obviously, you sacrifice some flexibility by going through GUI. Um, but we're here to talk about Python, so we'll crack on with that. OK, just a little bit more of what's actually in there and why Python is good to use. Uh, and then we'll just start writing some code and see how it goes. Do you have a question that you've got lined up, Benny? Well, actually, I do have one. Um, Johannes is saying that he's missing one very small thing is that he's saying that a data warehouse is usually also built used to build up history as source systems usually not do that um are there also options to do that in combination with databricks there are indeed yeah i mean so it is it is just a, a data storage layer you know so you can you can do various different things certainly that raw layer i mean you can just keep your history it's like a staging layer. you can just keep all the different day snapshot of files that you've received um when you're landing data you can do all of your normal data modeling things. You can do slowly changing. You can do type four SDDs. You know, all of that kind of data history is possible, um, especially with a file format called Delta. So there's a thing called Databricks Delta, which they've open sourced as Delta Lake. And that it sits on top of uh, a file type called Parquet. Parquet is column store compression. It's like a column store index in SQL, except it's the flat file version. Really, really good, efficient compression, great for analytics. And Delta adds like a transaction log layer on top of it and it enables things like merge. So you can write a merge statement in Spark and it'll handle it at the lake layer. So doing things like slowly changing, doing adding more updates, doing things like you know your incremental versioning of SCD2, that's now possible all within a parquet layer in a data lake. So yeah, building up history, absolutely. We tend to do that in the data lake layer now, as I said, because history is quite expensive. And if it's kind of the thing that people only look at occasionally, why not keep that big, long, expensive amount of storage in the lake where it's cheap and people only have to go to it occasionally? And you can have a much slimmer, much more streamlined warehouse that's doing the high concurrency, lots of people asking questions kind of stuff. So yeah, absolutely, lake is great for keeping long-term history. All right. Cool, under the hood. So a little bit about what's going on. So Databricks and Spark is written largely in Scala. So it's actually, it sits on top of things called JVMs, Java Virtual Machines. So the whole environment is Java. So it's all largely written in Scala, which compiles down into Java, and 80% or so-ish, it's always changing, I don't know the actual amount, is written in Scala. And sitting on top of that, you've got these things called resilient distributed data sets, essentially just data. You have data held in memory, spread across different workers, because the whole point is parallelism. The whole point is to be able to say, I've got a little bit of work to do and spread it across lots of boxes. And these things called RDDs, you'll see a lot if you start Googling around for Spark. Anytime they mention an RDD, that's a bit of data held in memory and it's the original API for doing anything within Spark. So if you're trying to write an aggregate, you're trying to join two data sets together, you're trying to do anything, then you have to write RDD commands. Um, and they're fairly hard to use and it's a lot like writing one of those MapReduce jobs. You have to tell it how to iterate, you have to tell it how to add things up. And it's it's fairly, fairly deep and fairly complicated. Now, a good few years ago now, they went, you know what, this is really hard. Why don't we make this much, much easier? So they made two APIs that sit on top of that RDD level. One is called the data frame, and data frames are like the core to everything that we do. So if you're writing Python or Scala or R, you write commands on the data frame, and that turns it into commands on the RDD and just makes it really efficient. Essentially, it's the equivalent of the, um, the SQL query engine. You know, so I can write a query and it'll go, okay, what's the best way to do that? How do I actually, what's the least physical uh, cost to do that? It'll optimize it for me and then it'll run the query in RDD language down in the Scala bit. But it means writing Python, writing R, writing Scala all get turned into the exact same thing because it all goes through the same query engine, which then turns it into the stuff that can run on the JVMs. So if you look at old school stuff, if you go back a few years, you're searching Stack Overflow and you find an answer from years and years ago, it will tell you, you have to write in RDDs and you have to write in Scala, otherwise it's slower. And that was true back then. These days, if you're doing anything at the data frame level, it doesn't matter if you write Python or Scala or R. It all gets turned into the same stuff under the hood. It is the same. So for me, I prefer Python because it's the language that I know better and it's a bit more flexible for what I do and it's 
easy, super easy to get started. There's loads of benefits to Scala and loads of benefits to R. But as long as you're using Data Frame API, it doesn't matter from a performance point of view what kind of thing you're doing in the data frames. The other side is SQL, and that goes to the same engine. Slightly different API, you can't do everything that you can do in data frames in SQL, but still, you can write a lot of transformations in SQL, write the same transformations in Scala, write the same transformations in Python or R, and they'll get turned into the same code. You can look at the execution plan, and it runs the same thing, which is great. So you can actually sort of test that out and go, is SQL the same as Python? Yes, doesn't matter. Don't let anyone tell you it's not. There's some exceptions, there's some edge cases, there's some other areas, but as long as you're just writing data frame manipulations and you're doing data preparation transformation stuff, really doesn't matter. Put it different way, you've got libraries on top of libraries. So you've got your RDD API sitting there in the middle, you've got data frames, data sets, and SQL API on the top. Data sets we won't go into. Um, they are purely Scala only, and they are strongly typed, whereas data frames are not in the fairly loose. Most, most functionality you see working at the data frame level these days. And then on top of that, you've got the other libraries, things like streaming, things like ML, things like writing graphs if you want to do nodes and relationships and that kind of stuff. So there's loads and loads of things all packed inside the Spark engine, which Databricks takes advantage of. And final thing before we start looking at some stuff, to give you an idea, so talking about distributed compute, we're always talking about, there's always this few steps that has to go through. So if I write a query, I write a bit Python, and I say, I want you to go get some data, I want you to aggregate it, and give me the results, go and count everything. Then I'll write that query, that query goes to the driver, driver then passes the work down amongst the different workers and says, well, actually, we know that this file is spread into these different chunks, these different extents down the lake. So actually, you, worker number one, go access that bit of the data. Worker number two, go access that bit of the data. It kind of splits up the work. We're already parallelizing the moment we start doing things. Each worker will go and access its own bit of the data. It'll pull it up, bring it into memory to do some work on it. They'll just provide their own results. That'll treat it as another job. So there's a second job to then take all different results, pass that to another worker, which will then get the results and pass it back. And everything we're doing is trying to think in those terms of a little bit of work, spread the work out amongst my workers. The workers do all a little bit of work, and then they all collate to get them and give me an answer. It's all parallelism. And that's one of the, you know, there's a couple of things to that. One means it's incredibly scalable. Things are going too slow, add some more workers, and it will go faster. You can get linear improvements in speed and performance, just because you're saying, well, actually, just have more cores. And by doing it on lots of small, inexpensive boxes, and saying, you know what, I just want another 10 small boxes, is actually a fairly cheap thing. And it came about because actually doing that on-prem, the bigger and kind of more powerful box that you get, the more expensive it's going to be. Uh, so being able to say, well, actually, I just want some commodity hardware. I'm just going to buy 100 really, really cheap little servers and just spread the work across there. So you have people building Spark and things working across Raspberry Pis, doing it in containers. Um, and especially when you come to the cloud, that kind of thing suddenly makes so much sense. So you have to say, you know what? I've got several terabytes, several petabytes of data I need to process. I'm going to spin up a 100 node cluster for the next 10 minutes and then turn it off again. And you're only paying for it while the cluster's turned on. And that suddenly just opens up a world of opportunity, a world of new stuff you can do that you physically couldn't before. You know, you had, you knew there was that one petabyte size bit of data that you had to process, you'd have to buy your whole server and plan around being able to process there. Whereas now it's just, a, you can do it on a whim and just spin it up for five minutes and turn it off again. And it's fairly cheap because it's just VMs. It's the whole point is just, just VMs that we're working with, which is cool. So let's have a look at Databricks. Let's have a look at Active Data and start having a bit of a play and see how we go. Feel free to shout any questions while I'm going through the workspace. And uh, we'll just kind of see what's going on if I bring that down. Okay. So this is the Azure Databricks workspace. So if you're on top of the portal, it has a little button like all the modern things do, like ADF now and Synapse, all these things. You hit open workspace and it opens a whole different area that we're in exploring Databricks. And there's a few things to be aware of. Most of it down this left-hand side. Firstly, you've got a workspace. So you have a whole place that you can go in, you can keep files, you can play around with things. These hold all your notebooks. Your notebooks essentially being scripts. Scripts I want to process, things I want to work with. Um, we've got data. We'll have a look at data once we've made sure I've got a cluster turned on. I'm just going to make sure my cluster is turned on. Oh, it is. That's nice. Um, 
And because we're doing all this stuff in parallel, because we're dealing with parallelism, clusters are super important. Getting the right cluster is, is a big, big deal. So we can go and create a cluster and a few different things we can do. So I can go and I'm do my data mines cluster. I've got a mode. So I can say it's standard or high concurrency. Um, standard is most things. Most data engineering things you'll be using standard. High concurrency is fantastic for our analysts. It's great if you've got lots of people writing small queries and looking at small bits of data. A um, couple of limitations. It locks it down so that you can't write Scala. So if you want to write Scala, don't use a high concurrency because it's not allowed. Um, and it has a thing called a fair usage broker. So if you've got a job that's running and it's running and running and running, and there's a few other things that are getting blocked because it's eating up all of your cluster, it'll just kill that long running job, which makes sense when you've got lots of analysts in the world trying to share a query and everything's nice. But if you're doing some data processing and something's running your fact, and that's just taking a while to process because it's big, then it's going to kill that off, and that's no good at all. So high concurrency, generally, we only use it for that kind of ad hoc querying and the kind of just the experimentation, the playing around with data cluster. For most data engineering jobs, I want to automate something, I want to have something running overnight, that's a standard cluster. Pools are if you want to pay to have a load of VMs turned on so your cluster turns on quickly rather than having to wait, which if you don't like money and you want to give it all to Microsoft, you can do. And the runtime. Essentially, what's the payload of libraries? What's the version of the thing that you want installed in it by default? So that's how you're dealing with you know, the versions. If um, there's one thing you can see at the top, you can see this kind of 7.0 beta coming in, which has Spark 3.0. That's a whole world of additional improvements. There's over a thousand commits into the Spark project, the Apache Spark project, that's part of Spark 3. So Spark 3 is coming very, very soon, and you should see a huge amount of performance tuning and extra stuff coming in. Hey, Simon, just a quick yeah. question. Uh, Robo wants to know if high concurrency can be used for real-time querying. What's the latency on it? Oh, so it depends what you mean by real-time. I mean, yes, you can query things that are real-time. You can query things that are being streamed to. Uh, generally, because of the overhead of parallelism, there's normally a second or so of latency. So for the smallest query, it's usually going to take at least a second to bring back some results because it has to pass the query to the driver, down to the workers, get some stuff, bring it back, bring it back to you, return the results. So it's not kind of your, um, you wouldn't put it behind a dashboard that it expects kind of your literal super quick millisecond responses. But if you want something to actually go and get the data and bring it back, you can use it. It's just be aware it's got, it'll have a second or two latency. Um, if you're gonna, if you need kind of a second or two late, like sort of millisecond latency, and you need that kind of constantly at high concurrency, Spark is not the answer. It is a parallel system that has economies of scale for doing big chunky queries. Hopefully that kind of answers. <laughs> yep, yep. He's uh, he said in chat that it answers the question. So great. Alrighty. Um, so yeah, pick your runtime. Again, runtime 7.0 coming soon, and that should be awesome when it comes. You have ML runtimes, which come with a huge amount of data science, uh, machine learning kind of run, um, libraries installed. But most important is these bits down here. So we've got things like auto scaling. Do I want it to just decide to change the number of workers depending on how busy it gets? Now that means it's a little bit less consistent in terms of how long things take, because occasionally your query and I'll go, ooh, this one's running a query, I'll just add some more nodes. And that's great and it's flexible and means uh, costs are managed. But the query takes a little bit longer because I'm waiting a minute or two for extra notes to appear. But what's going super, super useful. Auto terminate. Again, fantastic. I just want you to turn off if I've not ran a query for 20 minutes. And that is just, it just saves a wealth of time in terms of managing infrastructure. One of the really cool things is that if you've got something like Data Factory or you've got kind of something that's calling the REST API and it tries to run a job and Databricks is not turned on, it'll just start the cluster automatically. And the thing calling will have to wait four or five minutes for the cluster to turn on. But once it's turned on, it will run. And then if you've got terminate after minutes of activity, it'll turn itself off. No longer do I have to write bits of PowerShell to turn it on and then loop to wait until that's finished and then run my things and then wait until everything's finished and turn it off again. The whole idea of just turning infrastructure on and off kind of goes away when you tell it to terminate and life becomes easy. Okay, you can say how many workers do we want? So how many cores do we want and how much memory do we want? Um, we're not going to go heavily into it now because I, I can talk for several hours about how you size a cluster, but generally have that amount of memory in mind. So if I'm trying to deal with 10 gig of 
data. Can I fit it across two nodes of 14 gig? Yeah, I can kind of fit it in. But if I had that whole RAM to myself, but I don't. Generally, the Spark engine takes a chunk of data just to actually have it installed, like having the OS installed on a, on a machine. And then there's a bit withheld for like processing and a bit withheld for caching. So generally, rule of thumb, subtract a gig and half it. So if I look at that, maybe kind of uh, on a 14 gig, I'll probably have about four gig of memory I can use actively. So on those two workers, I'll maybe have about eight gig of data that can be processing at any one time. And if I'm trying to process 10 gig of data, that means just means I can't fit it all in memory at once. So it'll be able to process it, it'll chunk through it. It just means it's gonna to have to wait until it's finished some parts and then pick up the next bit. If I want that to go faster, I can just add another node and it'll be able to do it all at once. So the answer how big should my cluster be is how much data you're trying to process? Do you care if it has to do several passes or do you want to do it all at once? And then how many other people are using the uh, cluster at the same time? They're the kind of things that you need in mind. That's all we're going to go into it for now. Okay, so we've got a cluster. I've already got a cluster turned on. Um, and I've got this thing called data. So I've got something that looks like a SQL database. So I've gone in and I've saved some data and said, well, actually just remembers that's there. Treat it like a table. And I can go in and have a look at those things. And it is fully schemed. I can see samples of the data. I can go and save data actually so far to go back and look at it. So you know, although, you know, the idea of saying, you know, to your like SQL analysts, go and use our Spark cluster is a bit intimidating, it's a bit big. There's a load of stuff in there to make it actually much more usable, much more useful. Um, so there's lots and lots of stuff that we can do. Okay, cool. So let's go and do some things. I'm going to create a notebook. Call it. Hi, Evan. Do you have time for two questions? Uh, yeah, sure. All right, great. So Johannes wants to know that he's assuming that some form of a um, compression is applied to uh, data in memory. Yeah. Um, is it is a four gigabyte flat file does not equal to four gigabyte memory usage? No, but it also depends on what kind of flat file. So yeah. if four gig of Parquet, you're not going to see that much benefit of getting it into memory because Parquet is already really well compressed. Four gig of CSV is completely uncompressed. You might see some benefits. It, Consultant answer, it depends. Yeah. <laughs> Figured as much, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then another, yes. Yeah, and then another one, uh, Bart is saying that he's experiencing memory issues. Um, yeah. What does it mean for a cluster setup? Does he need to scale out, scale up, uh, but yeah. do both? Do a happy dance? Uh, what's the best way to answer this? Uh, can I go into a whiteboard and scribble something? This is going to be a horrendous drawing, so I apologize. Uh, that's clean, yeah. Okay, so. If I have a cluster set up, and again, apologies drawing with a mouse, but why not? Uh, and that's happy days and my data is spread across them. So I've got some data there and some data there, then I'm good. Um, certain commands. So if I write something called a collect, so if I do dataframe.collect, that forces all of my data as it is up into my driver. Now my driver is not big enough to get all that data in memory, that's gonna force a memory issue. So you can get it there quite, uh, quite often if uh, do I have text here? No, uh, no, not easily. <laughs> that is called a collect, just to apologize for the uh, mouse writing. There we go. Um, otherwise, certain things down at the worker level, if I run a command that forces it to reorganize the data, if I say organize via, you know, classic one is sale date, and I forget that, oh, actually Black Friday has like 90% of my sales, then it's going to have to try and collate that together in a single partition of data. Meaning suddenly I get a ton of data over here and I might exceed that top level amount. So it's understanding how much data I actually have, how much data I'm trying to collate onto any one single one of those boxes, either by collecting it to the driver or running certain aggregates and shuffles that force it into a single thing. Um, that's kind of when you're going to hit those memory issues. And so sometimes you'll be better by just adding more workers. But then if that kind of thing that you're writing is not because it won't fit on all the workers, but because you're trying to force it onto a single worker, that's when you start getting issues. Yeah. So Bart's saying that he's um, they're running queries with a ton of joins on it, joins on it, and it's not as much collecting data that he's talking about. Uh, so you're running a ton of joins. It depends. Yeah. So if it's trying to organize it around one of the join keys and it's trying to partition based on that, then it'll be creating a block that's too big to fit in memory of a single thing. Yeah. Um, I'd say that's probably a bit too deep for us to go into now. Probably yeah, I figured as much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> um, probably it'll, it'll just have to ping you on one of the socials and then get an answer that way. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks.
Okay, so let's write a little bit of Python. Uh, first things first, I have a lake. So I've got a little uh, ADLS Gen 2. So I've got my data lake stored Gen 2. It's got some data in it. So I'm going to have a look at some stuff in here. And I feel like I want to be able to go and query some data. So I've got my raw AO. So my completely, I've not touched this, it's just got some stuff in there. And I've got AdventureWorks, that's normal. Load of stuff in there, load of data. I want to be able to just query it. I want to be able to write a query and get, get my filthy hands on that data. So where do we even start? So I'm going to build up that path. So what's that path? I'm going to grab that thing, I reckon. Uh, in this case, I've kind of cheated in that my data is already mounted. So what I've done is I've told Databricks how to get hold of that data. It knows how to connect to this lake. So I know I can do that. So I've got some things. A lot of times in Databricks, you'll see things called dbutils. And then I can do dbutils file system. And then I can do maps. I can say, well, what's currently associated to my cluster? What does my cluster know about? And it tells me I've got a load of things in there. I know I've got db lake in there. So that's great. So connect to db lake. So I can go command slash db lake, because I've done that in advance. And that's now just available. Python variable, easy. If I refer to lock, that's going to tell me that's my location. It's just a string. OK, great. So I can do some stuff with that. I can say what's behind that, what's actually going to happen inside that location. So I can do db utils again. I can say in file system, undo ls. ls is kind of list structure, I think it stands for. I'm going to put lock in there. I go, what's in there? So it's, OK, you've got a load of, there's a load of folders, a load of files. So there's lots of things built in just to help with that general, explore some data, try and figure out some stuff. How do I get at this stuff? Which is great. So I know I've got at least, there's at least one bit of data I can get hold of. Makes sense. OK, so let's get rid of that. So I want to build up this. I want to build up a table name. So let's go, OK, so my actual location is going to be lock. And then we we'll do a thing called an f-string, just traditional Python. So f string is a way, it's string substitution. So I want to take a string, I want to insert lock inside it, and then I want to have a slash, and then I'll have a table name. So let's call table name. I'm going to do my table, I'm going to call it sales address. I want to include that. And all that's doing is just jamming two strings together, saying just put those together, please. Um, so I've got make a string, inject that in there, inject that in there, and then if I print out my location, I should see I've got my point going to one of them. Right, easy, happy days, bit of string manipulation, all good. Now I want to try and query it. I want to say go get hold of that data, bring it back, let me play with it. So I'm going to create a data frame. I'm going to push those part. People will be angry that I'm calling it DF because that is the the default variable name of all my data frames, but really straightforward. So DF. Same Spark, using the Spark libraries, spark.read. I want to build up a data reader. I want to go and understand some data. Now, I know it's CSV, so I'm going to tell it using the CSV. I want to go and give it that location. So I'm passing that location, so that whole string that points it there, into this as a parameter. And that's one of the big things, is just everything can be parameterized. So I can run that, hit go. And that's brought back a thing called a data frame. It's brought back a definition of my data. Now, it's not a great definition of my data. It doesn't know what it's called. It doesn't know how to understand it, because it's a CSV. It doesn't have any structure inherent inside it. So let's just do a quick display. Let's go what's actually inside there. And display is going to force it to actually read the data. So at first, it was just essentially just building a structure that I can work with. It's just say, building up a list of instructions. And I'm saying, based on my list of instructions, that is a pointer to that file. Go off, read it, bring it back. Now, can you see? Oh, I've got some data. So it's really, really simple just to say, I've got a flat file and like, go and get hold of it, go and bring it back. And I can see, oh, actually, it's got headers. I can understand that. So let's build that up. Let's go. OK, so I want to have an option. I want to say yeah, headers. I want that to be true. So we rerun that. We should see kind of our data frame definition, rather than having C0, 1, 2, 3, all that kind of thing, it's actually going to go do a little quick read of that file in advance. <laughs> don't know why that's taking so long. Um, it's going to work out what the headers are, and it should infer the column names. So I'll actually have a properly formed data frame when this runs. 
and it's just decided it's not going to run now, which is great. Well, that's fine. Do you have a question while we're waiting for it to run? <laughs> uh, yep. Actually, there are two. Uh, Nadim wants to know if there is any form of data masking available using Databricks. Um, not that I know of as a, a Databricks library, but in mm -hmm. terms of as Spark libraries, I'm sure there's a ton. So yeah. as I'll make a note, and then in the next session, I can just be pulling out some interesting libraries to do data masking. Yeah, then just pop it in the chat when you're uh, when you're following the next session. Great. Yeah. Then one more as well. Uh, well, I have you now. Robo wants to know if, uh, is your ADLS G2 um, storage using hierarchical namespaces? And does it matter a lot if it doesn't? OK, yes, cool. So you've got a thing called blob storage, which is the traditional storage mechanism in Azure. And that doesn't have folders. That's just everything is just one big flat pile of um, files. And you can make it look like it has files by having virtual folders by essentially in your file name, including slashes. And then when you explore it, it looks a bit like that. But essentially, everything is just one big giant flat list. Um, and they introduced this thing called hierarchical namespace to, and that, that's essentially what ADLS Gen 2 is. So it's your data lake storage, Gen 2. It's just blob storage that has hierarchical namespace enabled. Uh, and what that is essentially is saying, I want to have an object called a folder. So rather than have to create a file that has the path in there, and until I've created that file, I don't see any folders because folders don't exist. I have to, you have dummy files to create folders. It's nasty. Hierarch namespace, I can create a folder object. And super importantly, that means I can secure that folder object. So I can say, here's a folder. This um, Active Directory team has read access to that folder. This team has write access to that folder. And it can do things like, you know, it can make a partition elimination better saying only read things that are in this folder, not that folder. Every time you read a file in ADLS, there's just a tiny overhead in terms of performance. You have to go, do I have access to you? Do I have access to you? Do I have access to you? Across a load of things. Scale it up to tens of thousands of files, suddenly things become really slow. Hierarchical on namespace means read things in that folder, not those folders. Suddenly you can optimize things a lot more. So hierarchical on namespace makes a massive difference for managing security, the general kind of operation level of the lake uh, and has some performance benefits. So ADLS Gen 2, all good. All right, thank you. No worries. Okay, okay, we'll do time. Oh, 20 minutes? Uh, yeah, 20 minutes-ish, but if you go a few minutes over, it's not that bad. Cool. Okay, so coming back over here, you can see I now have something that looks a lot more like a data set. It managed to read those headers in. So because I have that option header is equal true, it's changed the data frame reader, it's managed to understand it, See my data frame object, some stud things, but ah, everything still has a string. So actually, we can make it better. We can say, well, I want you to go in and infer a schema. So I can turn things like infer schema up. And there are hundreds of these options and libraries and tricks and things built into it. There's loads of CSVs, different ones for JSON, different ones for Parquet. But essentially, you can do this kind of thing. You can build out fairly complex um, operations. So that's all right. OK, I can access some data. I can play with some stuff. Really importantly, I can take that data frame and I can do create or replace a temp view. Make that my, what is this? This is address. I can do that. And what that does is that registers it temporarily with the SQL engine. So I can do things like actually, rather than Python, make my next command SQL. So I'll do a select star from, oops, I'm sorry, I can type. Through, and that's still going back to that CSV. Everything is still tied back to that original file. So when I hit go in this, it's still going back and reading from the data lake, but I've just put a metadata pointer in so I can now express SQL against it. So suddenly I can actually tie together a load of stuff I'm doing in Python with, uh, I've forgotten what the data frame manipulation or window function is. I can just write it in SQL. So you can suddenly kind of opens up a whole world of different extra stuff you can do. But that's still not that cool, so we can get better. OK, what I want to do with this, let's do a little manipulation. So I want to say my data frame. Uh, data frames are immutable. So if I want to change the data frame, essentially I need to say overwrite the data frame with a new version of itself. So my data frame is equal to my data frame dot, and say with a comma. And I want to know the file name. Traditional stuff. Um, so I want input file name, and that's using a PySpark library. So I do need to do a little thing before I can run that. 
to say actually use it. So you hit import. Um, I'll do it the dirty way from PySpark.sql.functions. So that's going to go through. So it's imported that, so it knows what that is now. And then it's brought back my data frame. It's not done anything. But it just now knows when I run this, I'll have a file name. So I do a quick display on that again. And DF is now, my updated data frame has now got that transformation I've asked for. I've asked it to go and append a file name. And now I've got the exact file name as a lineage column inside my thing, which is great, useful. So let's keep going, let's make it cooler. I want to write that somewhere, right? I want to take that data, write it down, and say, make me a new file out of it. So data frame.write. And I want this to be delta. I'm going to use the new file format. It's going to be delta. And I can give it a location. And again, that can be variable driven. So let's make this better. I want my variable to be the same as that. So I'll make a save location. And that's going to be, let's put it in my uh, laboratory. Um, okay. So we've got that together. We'll just check that save lock works. Okay, good. And then I want the same one of that. So I want to have my save location with the table name in there. Then we can go and have a look what that's like. And there we go. So I've got a place I wanted to go and save that data to. Whoop. The old one. Look. Okay. So now I can take that and put my save location into my save. And so all this little piece is going to do, so it's going to read that with my file from CSV. It's going to pass it a little bit, work out the data types. I'm going to add it in a lineage column, and I'm going to write it down to delta and save it there. I'm going to do a quick thing. I'm going to add a mode. Overwrite. So if there's any data there already, I just wanted to trash it and replace it with this new data. So that should hopefully work. And then we can try and do something cool. Ooh, end a file. I forgot to put the end bracket in. There we go. OK. Mm -mm -mm. It's complaining that I didn't put my forward slash in there. Can't be relative. Let's go through and be run that. And there we go. OK, so it's doing the run again, reading the data through, appending that file name onto it, writing it down. And there we go. So I've now got that file living there. If I go back to my lake in that lab location, I should see that data. So let's just go and have a quick check. So I can go into my root, go into my lab, uh, public, benchworks, sales address. And there we go. I have this thing. It's a delta table, so it's now in Parquet, and I've done some trade data transformation. And again, lots of things can do data transformation. That is easy. So we can pull some of this stuff together. OK, so let's do that. So I'm going to work out the location dynamically. Um, but we can do a little bit fancier. So if I just make a list, I do have a list of these things. So let's just go, instead of a single table, I want a list of tables. I want to do lots of stuff. Uh, and I can do a four table in my list. And then I can say, well, actually, just do each, do this for each one, for everything, each one of these things I've got in my list of stuff, I want to go and run that same thing. So in this case, I'm going to say, well, get rid of tables, replace that with T, and then it's going to run through this whole program. It's going to make my new location by injecting the table name. It's going to get my save location by working it out. It's going to read it in as a CSV, input the file name, and then spit out a different thing. So I think I should be able to just run that. And it'll do it several times, work out several data frames. And that's now passing a load of different CSVs, running the same job for each of them, landing them as different delta tables that's now suddenly doing rudimentary data processing. And that is the powerful thing. The fact that this whole script is not tied to a specific type of data. It's not tied to one specific data set. It's tied to actually a set of transformations that can be applied to any data set that I can parameterize. And that's when it suddenly becomes very, very interesting. And a lot of times people, you know, they, you hear Spark and you hear big data and you think, well, it doesn't apply to me because I don't have petabytes of data. And for me, that doesn't matter. For me, what matters is I have 10 tables already 
I'm going to save time by just writing this one script and say, we'll just do the same thing for each of my 10 tables. So you can do a load of stuff just to suddenly push all that through. So then I go back, have a look at my lake. I should be able to see in public adventure works. I've now got a load of data, each of which with its own schema, each with which with its own stuff. So suddenly it becomes super, super powerful when you start putting things like variables in there for each loops. Now, I probably wouldn't do this normally. I wouldn't put a for each loop inside uh, a single notebook to do big data frame things because this is going to, this is done sequentially. So it's run one data frame and then go back to the start, run the next one, run the next one. But what I can do is I can call Databricks through Data Factory. So I can do things like spin up orchestration. So I can do things like saying, well, actually, my table name, table name is a useful thing. I want to be able to put my table name in as a variable. So I've got dbutils dot widgets and say dot text. Make, make a new thing called a text widget. And a widget, it looks a bit like uh, SSRS parameters. I can just say, give me a text box. Uh, I'm going to call this. This can be my table name. I want it to default to salesLT.address. I want to call it my adventure works. I run that. Right at the start, you can see that's now added an input. So my notebook's now expecting an input that I can then use throughout. Now I need to assign it to something, so I need to be able to say my table is dbutils.widgets.get. And then because I called it table name, that's what I want to get. So I want to go and get table name. I can run that. And that's now assigned that whatever the value of that widget is, is now available just as tibble. So I can go, what is tibble? And it'll give me sales LT address. So I can do things like set this up, set data factory up, tell data factory to do a for each and call loads of loads of notebooks in parallel, each one putting different things in, but then still I can have my entire script be variable driven. So I can make it parameterized the type of file. I don't need to write a completely different thing for CSV versus pipe separated versus parquet versus others. You can have generic um, scripts which are saying for everything, regardless of the type, add some lineage columns, strip out things that are equal to this, put it over there. You can just do vast amounts of stuff with that. So it's pretty cool. Okay, uh, any questions? Uh, Simon, yeah, one note that's really tailored to what we're showing just now with the widgets. Uh, Tom wants to know if they can be parameterized from Spark, Spark submit job parameters. Yeah, yeah, so they are essentially Spark submit job parameters that it uses. Um, I don't know the exact syntax for it, but yeah, they are available through it. You can also do it through the REST API. Uh, you can also do it straight from Data Factory. So yeah, whichever way you can get a parameter into a Python file, you can actually hook into those widgets, which is pretty cool. Um, I saw another one, uh, error handling. Yes, you yep. do have error handling. It's not called try catch. It's called try accept because it's Python. Um, if you're using uh, Scala, you can do Scala style. Essentially, whatever the error handling of the language you're using is the style of error handling that you use. Yep, and Spark SQL is probably able to do that as well in some form. Can you do error handling in Spark SQL? I've never tried. Honestly. Yeah, well, that, that's because, yeah, well, 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 let's say you'll check quickly and then get yeah, back to it good. in the next session. Uh, one, of the, one of the super interesting things you can do for SQL to make things a little bit more dynamic. So if you're writing things in that kind of SQL block that we had, that kind of percentage SQL, and then I'm going to write my select blah, 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 that can be a little bit hard to inject parameters into and like sort of work with that stuff. Um, but what you can do is do spark.sql. And note this is, I'm still writing Python, but inside there I can do my select star from address. And I can even make a data frame. I can say, well, my new SQL data frame, or my data frame v2, is equal to run some SQL on that. And then that's just a data frame I can work with. So even if you can't quite get the error handling that you need to out of what's out of the box in terms of SQL, I can wrap, I can wrap the SQL in some Python, and I'm still within the Python language and put whatever error handling Python has. So 100% you can do it by hook or crook. <laughs> and again, that, once again, is a parameter, right? I've just hard-coded the string, but I can actually sort of do you know, the same thing we did earlier. I can say my SQL is equal to have a string that I generate, and then I can pass that SQL in. So everything can be parameterized, and that's the real true 
power of Spark in my eyes. Cool. So you know, I did have a load of other slides about how you get deeper into data validation, um, but I think that will probably take the next hour or so, so I don't think we'll go into that. Oh, are there any further questions I can do while we've got a notebook open or while we're having some stuff? Yep. Uh, Chris wants to know, are there any notable differences between Azure Databricks and Databricks on AWS? Ooh, um, not really. There are some. Um, certainly the, the core engine, as I've seen, is the same. You know, so the release runtime is kind of in uh, parity. Uh, the main thing is to do with integration. You know, so some of the things that you can do straight away with Databricks and AWS may take a month or two before they appear in Azure because they've integrated different things. Um, certainly, it's important that, you know, if you're looking at the docs for it, you've got the Azure Databricks and you've got the Databricks and AWS documentation are different. So if you, you know you're in the, um, the AWS one because it's the Databricks hosted one as opposed to one on the Microsoft docs. But the main difference is, you know, there's some automation done in terms of what you can do with S3. Uh, there's one or two things that kind of get released first. But in terms of the actual core engine, I think they're largely the same. Uh, okay, so Robo wants to know um, how exactly did you define your mounts and tables? Uh, can a table sure. just be a CSV file on any list G2 and then do a df.read CSV construct? Yeah, so the mount is there's a there is a dbutils command called dbutils.fs.mount and that has a few parameters. And one of the things I did in there is put in my blob storage name and my blob storage key which I thought probably unwise to share with the world. <laughs> um, but there is syntax. I'll share the link in the, uh, in the chat afterwards. Essentially, there's a couple of config parameters you give to it. You need to be a little bit careful with mounting, because uh, if you mount some storage, essentially you're saying anyone who used the Databricks workspace gets that same level of access to the thing you've mounted. Uh, so you don't, you don't mount a file, but you can mount a folder, or you can mount a whole disk. So it can mount a blob storage account, and then just everything in, in one of the containers. I can mount a particular directory in ADLS Gen 2, and then people can get all of the subfolders in there. Um, but remember, so once you've mounted something, that is permanent for that um, workspace, unless you physically unmount it. You know, so you can do unmount, I can tell it to get rid of one. But once you've mounted something, anyone accessing that workspace, anyone accessing any cluster can go and do that stuff. Uh, and yeah, it's mounted to the workspace. So the, um, the lake I'm um, working with, I just mounted to my whole database workspace. So any notebook I use will be able to see that those same addresses, be able to go and use that stuff. Any user jumping on there. Uh, yeah, mounts persist across cluster restarts, turning things on and off across different clusters. Mounts is in everything in the workspace. So other options, one thing you can do is worth noting if you are using a high concurrency cluster, uh, one thing you have under advanced options is this little button. So is your data lake store credential pass through? So essentially, if you've got Active Directory and you've given different people, different teams access to the data lake, rather than mounting it, and so everyone has the same access, if they're doing that ad hoc querying, the exploration of data, then you can enable this. And then they just go, they can put in straight the, um, the data lake link, so the ABFSS full link, and then it'll work based on AD pass-through. So for your analysts, for your users, for the people kind of doing some exploration, then absolutely high concurrency is great for that, with the downsides of it does kill things if it's running for too long, and it doesn't allow Scala. All right. Um, so one thing that I missed myself because I was answering chat windows, is the mount, is, is it persisted in between cluster restarts? Yes. Yeah, so the mounts, once you've set a mount up for a workspace, it will persist unless you unmount it. All right, across thank you. Across restarts, across you can walk away for a month and come back, it will still be mounted. 